last time, but I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to, to join you today in, uh, in, in your seminar series, and I will tell you about our research at Auburn and a bit of background on myself and, and how I ended up doing what I do at, uh, at Auburn, and hopefully at the end of the day, uh, after my talk, we have identified further opportunity for collaborate, collaboration. So you see my screen right, right? Yes. Okay. So I will um, kind of give you a background, kind of like strong accent because I'm a very Southern girl. So I was born and raised in uh, Argentina. I am from um, Santa Fe. I got myself a degree in analytical chemistry. I studied very early on my passion for pulp and paper uh, engineering and, and all the all the likes on material science uh, back home at the National Institute of the Institute of uh, Cell Technolo Cellulose Technology in uh, the Universidad Nacional del Litoral in the Chemical Engineering Department. And I, I was uh, fortunate enough to join NC State University. For those of you know, uh, Orlando Rojas, Professor Rojas was my PhD advisor. And I studied the PhD on pulp and paper engineering that very quickly with the transition or the declining of the pulp and paper industry converted into forest biomaterials. I spent a very uh, short stay at Alto University as a visiting uh, scientist and returned to Finland as a postdoctoral fellow at DPT, uh, where I was hired as a, as a scientist there. And I ended up spending uh, a couple of more years of what I intended to in, in, in Finland working in the high performance fiber uh, group at uh, DTT, which is the national labs or used to be the national labs at uh, Finland, nowadays a, a limited company. I joined Auburn University as an assistant professor in 2016, and I had the, the opportunity to build the program on, on biomaterials and, and what we call today the Sustainable Biobased Materials Club. And I'll tell you how that was conceived and how, how this, um, what are the, the research topics that we're focusing on. As uh, Dr. Nehia uh, mentioned, I, I got tenure uh, in 2021, and I was uh, promoted to the rank of associate professor of uh, biomaterials. So basically, and I will tell you a lot of things that you already know uh, with the traditional uses of good, being housing, communication, and transportations, we are all in this uh, together trying to rethink the use of trees and other type of biomass to move from this traditional um, utilization or traditional markets to a whole new range of uh, products that we can think of in terms of uh, bio-based and lignocellulosic in particular uh, polymers where we can expand the utilization uh, and create value to the stakeholders and landowners into a new applications, including functional uh, fibers and textiles, packaging, lightweight composites, anything that you can think of that we are using currently, uh, commodity plastics or commodity like poly synthetic polymers uh, to replace to those renewable alternatives. And the mot motivation of this is not probably new for this audience, but we are all into um, increasing the national security to decrease the dependence of foreigner uh, foreign resources to increase internal markets, uh, particularly agriculture and, and forestry, at the time that we decrease, decrease greenhouse gases emissions and also replace those limited resources for those sustainable ones. So the um, opportunities are rather uh, large. And here you can see a map of the forest land in the United States where you can see the, the very bright green uh, areas are privately owned uh, forest land and being at Auburn University here in the Southeast, where, where we consider the good basket of the, of the country, we have plenty of opportunities to utilize this and help the, the forest industry to grow in this so-called bio-based economy. And in parallel to this, like we, as I mentioned earlier, with the decline of the pulp and paper industry back in the time. So here you can see in this map, all these red dots are indicating um, mill close or like job jobs loss uh, due to mill closures in the period of 2014 to 2016. And this trend continues to, um, it, it continue to increase the opportunity into infrastructure for, for biomass processing, but also like uh, workforce development as well. So we have plenty of opportunities if we, if we wish to go in this direction and, and move the economy forward in the bio-based um, 
uh, plank of things. So as you are all familiar with the traditional pulp mill, uh, the way that we, we are used to process and the way that we really know how to process uh, biomass into paper, we take the wood chips and we process them, we digest them, and about 50% of this wood dry um, mass will end up in the side streams. And we know how to utilize that, and we know how to uh, increase the, or like uh, optimize the value into energy on this. But the trend is to like make a more efficient, a more holistic utilization of the natural resources to move forward, what we call the modern pulp mills, where we input wood and take the pulp to make paper and cardboard, but we also take all those side streams and converting them to um, added value products as well with a whole range of uh, new application markets as well. And this can be achieved by uh, uh, increasing or, or like in improving the way we work with others in terms of the multidisciplinary approaches. And that, that brings me to the to the next uh, topic that we'll talk today is with, which is in the nano nanoscale towards nanocellulose production and the scale of things. And I always like to say that uh, contrary to some what some people say, my, uh, size freely matters. And here you can see like a scale of things uh, between small molecules and th things that we can really see with our bare eye and how can uh, mother can be manipulated in, in in terms of modifying size of material. And an example I like to, to talk about is like inorganic uh, or metals and, and inorganic materials. You can see here cadmium, selenide are also like gold and silver. In bulk, we all know how it look like in bulk, but then when we started going down in size, then we create a whole new phenomena in the, in the material based on the interactions of these nanoparticular, nanoparticles with uh, light and other uh, mother, and we can create new uh, opportunities in terms of properties. So this is inherent to all uh, kind of materials, and we can think about uh, biomass as well. If we think about a tree into a macro scale, and how can we like start like deconstructing that um, a hierarchical structure of, of biomass, and you start looking into the cell wall, we are um, deconstructing this into like cellulose, uh, chains that they are like packed into fib fibrils or nanofibrils, that they are nothing else that cellulose fibrils embedded in a uh, matrix of other polysaccharides and lignin that they will um, uh, assemble back up into the tree. So when we start looking at cellulo the cellulose fibers and we deconstruct the cell wall, we will have these like micro size fibers that we can see in an optical microscope. And then we, we can turn them into um, paper, but we also can go down to the nanoscale and then have a, a whole new set of properties that we can uh, think of to play around and create new phenomena. And for scale, here is a uh, human hair strand, and you can think about how many nanocellulose particles can fit into your, um, in one strand of uh, hair. So, Couple of ways to make nanocellulose, we can deconstruct this cell, um, cell wall by a chemical means, like meaning like a mild acid hydrolysis. And what we achieve with this is that we are gonna remove the less order regions of the cellulose, um, the cellulose fibers, and we are remaining with this like crystalline domain that looks like this, like a uh, rod-like um, uh, particles that they are assembling in a colloidal suspension in water and they will look like this um, uh, bowl of rice, that's as, as we like to call them. In the contrary, if we use mechanical treatment to separate these fibrils and then with or without a pretreatment that could be enzymatic or chemical to facilitate the, the, the fibrillation of the, of the mother, we end up what we call cellulose nano or microfibrils, uh, which is that um, we are reducing the size in one dimension in the in the diameter of the fiber and we keep the length sort of uh, intact. And then we also have um, the analogy that the cellulose microfibrils will look like a bowl of rice of a spaghetti where all these fibrils are in touch uh, with each other and then we'll create this uh, 
very strong networks that will be relevant into the in terms of the properties and the applications that we can think of this uh, geometry of the particles. And then the third type of nanocellulose that we are uh, familiar with or that we, we can isolate from um, bacteria is bacterial uh, cellulose, which is like the most pure form of um, cellulose that we can find out there because it doesn't have this matrix of other carbohydrates and, and lignin and is mainly utilized for uh, biomedical applications. So overall, we can uh, think of cellulose as a, as a very large variety of different uh, Geo, uh, geometries and also like charge and chemistry of these materials. So I like to say that there is no good or bad nanocellulose, it's just different based on how you make it and what you start with in terms of um, raw material. But if, it, if you look at this uh, uh, mapping of different types of nanocellulose, you can think about the nanocrystalline cellulose, thinking about more on the colloidal dispersion type of uh, material, nanofibers are a bit more polyelectrolyte like materials. And then we're going to have this, depending on what level of fibrillation and what kind of different uh, processing uh, we have or pretreatment, we will have a certain level of branching of the structure that will like render different uh, properties and again, better or, or worse for certain applications as well. Kind of the mapping on structure function relationship or for nanocellulose between these three. Um, level of uh, or components being raw materials, the structure and the chemical composition, and the type of pretreatment that we have, and the fibrillation uh, or the the cell wall, the construction method that we choose for. So, in terms of uh, properties of uh, nanocellulose, when we talk about, and, and I will make a, a a note that I I call nanocellulose, where we usually, in reality, we have like more. A, Com, uh, like a combination of nano and, and microfibers all together. But what you can see here in this like four spoon is like a nano slash microfibrillated cellulose at about 2% of solid that suspended in water will form this very strong network that is held by hydrogen bonds that has a very particular um, flow behavior. So it's like a shear thinning, meaning that it flows under, under shear. And it's a very appealing property if we think about coatings, for example. And then also, like if we think about the nanocrystalline cellulose or the colloidal dispersions because of the, the, the charge and the geometry of these particles, they self-assemble into liquid crystal um, materials, also very appealing for certain applications such as um, the touch screens for your phones. Imagine your, your computer being um, your screen of your computer being made out of nanocrystalline cellulose. So in terms of applications for this, when we talk about nanocellulose in uh, suspension, in, in, in aqua suspension, we can think about emulsifiers, stabilizers, they are also um, very uh, appealing for thickeners or tex texture modifiers, particularly in the food industry, and also in the paints and coatings as well as the ad adhesives. So this is pertaining when we have the nanocellulose or microcellulose into, into, um, into uh, suspension. So what happens when these suspensions dry? So what we can uh, see, the, uh, this nanocellulose has a very good uh, film formability, particularly if we are talking about very small fibril size, we can have like a the leaves, trans translucent or transparent films. Here you can see this um, in this, uh, Slide, you can see the, a, a piece of paper that is like opaque, but also you can see a nanofibrillated cellulose um, film that is like fully transparent. And this is nothing uh, more than uh, like caused by the size of the fibril that we cannot really like, distinguish uh, with our bare eye, the difference and the, and the, the, the disruption of the, of the light. So this material, because of the, the fibrils are so small, they do present excellent mechanical strength and barrier properties. And also, uh, if we are talking about nanocrystalline cellulose, when, it, when they, the suspension dry, they will retain the liquid crystal behavior and they will also have iridescent and, and birefringency patterns that we can play with and create uh, certain uh, domains and, and, and interactions with light to produce very colorful uh, colorful uh, films. So as 
per these uh, applications, of course, packaging is one of the, the main uh, or like one very appealing application that we can think of. Uh, we can think about nanocellulose, uh, nanofibrillated cellulose for uh, coatings, as well as fillers and, and also us in the composite industry as well. And because it's like made out of biomass and renewable sources, it's like at the least uh, compostable, if not biodegradable in some cases, it's gonna be biocompatible and it has a great, um, uh, like much larger surface area than the, the microscopic fibers as such, which give, give us a, a larger amount of hydroxyl groups that we can play with for functionalization. And this is very relevant because we can take this template and then we can apply all the chemistry that we know that it can uh, work with hydroxyl um, group chemistry and then we can impart new properties in this, uh, new functionalities in this great substrate that will further increase the applications and the, and the, the markets if you, if you wish. So here is like one, one um, very high level uh, schematics where we can think about why we want to modify nanocellulose and, and it's because the demand of these like value added cellulose based products is increasing. We can take advantage of this and we can think about materials that they will, uh, that they will require like high volume but very low cost, like for, for example, as a additive for paper making, but also we can think about like applications that they will require very low volumes, but very high um, cost or like a added value. If we think about applications in the, in the, in the space of bioactive and responsive films or other packagings uh, with a responsive um, uh, properties or like conductivity or barrier properties or different or different applications of the different properties that we want in part. Now this doesn't come um, come come always uh, the cost of a trade off uh, into strength loss, for example, because if we use some of those hydrogen hydrogen bonds to create new functionalities, and we will lose um, strength on the and hydrogen bonding, and we will lose. The, the strength of the film. So it's always a trade-off that you we need to be aware of and, and, and try to like take the most advantage of. In terms of applications, here are a couple of um, studies from uh, 2017 and 2019 in terms of uh, market studies on where these applications are the most promising on. Uh, everything that I take from these market studies, I take it with a grain of salt, but everything indicates that the market for uh, nanocellulose applications is uh, steadily increasing with a projection um, to growth up to like one billion dollars uh, by 2027 with a great CAGR index. Um, the, in terms of applications, uh, traditionally the, the paper and packaging application has been the, the one that has the highest market penetration for a simple reason that nanocellulose being produce on site in a paper mill to be applied as an additive in the in the paper um, in the paper products is the most uh, economically feasible uh, route to commercialize nanocellulose or to apply nanocellulose but we can see an increase in other applications like as cement and composites as well as textiles and non wovens and some other applications like food products coming growing very strong in terms of market penetration. So it's a really good time for us to be studying nanocellulose for all of us who are trying to work on this and trying to like make the, the, this leap into new markets, as well as uh, trying to bridge those uh, technological barriers that are out there. So what we focus in, in my lab in terms of um, uh, applications, so we try to understand the structure function relationship between the materials and the processing and the type of modifications we can uh, achieve to create this um, um, improving improving this uh, utilization of agriforest biomass trying to increase or like apply nanotechnology to it and improve the utilization of not only um, establish uh, su uh, supplies of the of the biomass, but also like try to look at these byproducts of certain um, certain agri uh, forest industry as well into new markets. As I said, moving from the traditional utilization to alternative one and try to like work on product development. 
And the focus of, of our lab is to understand the interfacial and surface uh, science behind this and trying to like tweak or take advantage of the, the natural composition of the material, tweak the, 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 the interfaces and modify these, uh, these surfaces to create value um, to these materials. So we work with suspensions and trying to understand the rheological behavior and the surface charge of these suspensions. And then we um, create a model two-dimensional structures that we can study using surface sensitive techniques. And I have a couple of examples there. We, we look at the, the interfacial behavior of nanocellulose with uh, certain analytes that they are of interest. And I will give you a couple of examples using quartz crystal microbalance with dissipation monitoring, for example, surface plasma resonance. And also we look into morphology with ASM and, and um, try to understand surface energy of these materials to further uh, assemble these materials into three-dimensional structures, beads, hydrogels, or fibers, with always keeping an application in mind. And I will give you also a couple of examples of what are the applications that we're focusing on and what we're after in, in terms of product development. And one thing I wanted to, to mention is like when I when I joined Auburn, uh, I, I joined the back back in the in 2016 was a school of forestry and wildlife. So it was a bit of a challenge to create this program and to like try to find uh, the niche of research that we would sustain over time. So basically what we focus on uh, was in, in, in local, regional and global pro problems that we could, we could tackle from the material science point of view. And as such, so we focus on sustainable solutions for adhesive and coating systems, trying to like remediate the volatile organic compounds emissions reduction for um, uh, good composites, for example, particle boards, trying to like work with adhesives alternatives using nanocellulose and as an uh, additive for that. Uh, water remediation being another of the research areas that we're looking at with the uh, increasing emerging contaminants in, in water streams, as well as bacterial contamination through um, certain uh, invasive species that we have here in the Southeast. We also started looking at active ingredient control release materials. Um, for uh, pesticide fertilizers and so on and so forth, as well as detection uh, devices for certain um, diseases. And also we recently started working on the, on the space of additive manufacturing. So as, as term, in, in terms of uh, biomass processing capabilities we have, so we are able to isolate uh, nano, mainly nanofibrillated uh, nano cellulose. We do have like a, uh, pilot scale Masuko supermass colloid we can produce nanocellulose from a variety of sources, including um, uh, not only uh, software and hardware, but also like all kind of uh, byproducts of other industries, such as uh, soybean holes. We work with um, pecan holes, peanut holes, anything that, that we can get our hands on uh, that has that contains. Um, cellulose and, or lignocellulose. We also have the capability of isolating lignin, other, other sugars, pectin, and so on. And we try to like improve or like study this in terms of um, uh, the, their potential using their own um, or the, the native state as, as they are. So one of the recent questions that we want to, to, to answer is like how this raw material composition will affect the surface properties of the nanocellulose and, and how can we improve the use of biomass over time, meaning the, the effect of the source, uh, the degradation patterns, and also the purity of the use of these materials and how can we uh, mainly take advantage of those as, as such. So I will focus uh, mainly in, in this portion of my talk on the adhesive and coating systems and some also some um, examples of the byproducts utilization in, in additive manufacturing as well. So this is uh, Celeste Iglesias, a um, PhD student from my, my lab that recently graduated and moved on uh, into the, the private sector. So she was um, very invested on studying the, the role of the chemical composition, not only com like comparing like 
good bio good base um, sources and uh, with different learning content. So like for for this, uh, what she did was like a sequential delignification of the fibers and try to understand the flow behavior of this material and how this was uh, correlated to the to the the morphology of the fibers. And she also compared good base source with a um, soybean nanofibril cellulose also with uh, like completely bleach and um, lignin containing. And she was able to um, work on a very nice fundamental piece of uh, work that like elaborates on these biological properties and how the, the structure of the fibers are um, mainly driven by their chemical composition and also like how that affect the, the final rheological behavior of this. So this was like kind of a seminal work that we did to understand what is the, 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 the properties or like the, the impact of this chemical composition into certain applications as uh, in, in the case of good composite adhesives. And what we did in this case, we try, we use our, uh, our surface sensitive techniques to, to understand the behavior or the interactions between uh, nanocellulose that it was like completely bleached versus lignin containing nanocellulose within this case, urea formaldehyde resin to understand how was the, how were these interactions and the surface free energy and try to like replicate these or like move forward and, and, and try to predict their behavior into particle board using uh, urea formaldehyde as a, as a resin. So what we, what we saw with our uh, quartz crystal microbalance here, for those who you are not familiar, so what basically this is, is like a quartz um, piezoelectric sensor that will resonate at a certain frequency and it will have our, in this case, has our nanocellulose in the, in the left, you will see the bleached nanocellulose versus LCNF, meaning the lignin containing nanocellulose or unbleached nanocellulose. And then we will expose this to a resin of urea formaldehyde with a hardener and then um, a dampening in the frequency of this, uh, this surface will relate to a, an increase in mass, meaning an, uh, re, in interactions of the cellulose with the resin. And by uh, rinsing that, we will have a total adsorb or irreversible mass adsorb on, on the surface. So what we, what we saw in this case was that the, the lignin containing nanocellulose was um, slightly uh, interacting slightly more with the urea formaldehyde resin, but also more stable over time. And this kind of translates what we saw later on when we created our, uh, we produced the, the particle boards uh, with a loading of the urea for the, of the bleach and unbleached nanocellulose, so which we also compare it to um, commercially available nanocellulose from the bleach nanocellulose from the University of Maine. We saw a clear um, improvement uh, improvement on the mechanical properties based on internal bond MOE MOR as well as the thickness swelling and water absorption in the case of lignin containing nanocellulose, meaning that our indication on the two-dimensional studies using QCMD were quite accurate. And we are um, further investigating this approach as a possible way of uh, anticipating the behavior of uh, our nanocellulose materials with other, uh, mate uh, other components as well. In this similar line of work, we also are studying together in a project with um, the University of Idaho, there is an NSF, a uh, project where we are trying to develop these materials using additive manufacturing, that we are gonna move uh, to a completely recoverable um, bioresin that it will be uh, fully made from biomass, if you, if you wish. Um, in, the, the, in this schematic, you can see the, the circular bio-based construction. What we're looking at is like material for construction basically, and you can see the bio-based resin production, which is our, our team at Auburn, is that what we are trying to do is that we are creating um, bio-resins from bio, bio oil that they will be um, reinforced with nanocellulose and made as a primary uh, resin for a good, a good flower that will be 3D printed into panels for construction. 
Now we are in the year one of this project and there's a lot to do, but uh, it's very promising the, the way that, that we are, uh, we have partnered with the mechanical engineering department at uh, the University of Idaho. We, we are the quite in charge of the, the 3D, the 3D printing or the, the 3D printing of these materials. And there will be also a performance evaluation team that will predict fire and mechanical resistance of this material. And the last component of the project is this cradle to cradle design where some, a group of architects at the University of Idaho will actually use this material into, into um, building um, buildings and, and, and work on the, on the final assessment of the, of the product. So what we are doing in my group towards this, uh, this uh, bio-based resin teams on the, on the print timber project is that we're looking again, the, 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 the interactions be between different types of nanocellulose, again, bleach and, and bleach nanocellulose with uh, epoxy resins and with a variety of other resins that they are coming later on in the, in the, in the project to see where, are, where is the optimum, hopefully we can infer what is the optimum loading for our, our bio-based resin to improve the properties and make, make it part to those commercially available. So very early stages, again, we are working on this, but what we have managed to do was like we have uh, identified the loadings of uh, nanocellulose in terms of the uh, epoxy resin. In this case, it's like up, up to like 1% of uh, nanocellulose content of the of the, um, the uh, nanocellulose on the epoxy will improve the mechanical properties and as well the thermal uh, behavior. And here you can see a little picture of a rod that is like that, that's the, the type of rod that the University of Idaho is looking at um, 3D printing slash extruding for, towards these panels and we are looking into um, evaluating a variety of resins and a variety of different types of nanocellulose to optimize its system. And hopefully I will have a better update next time when I come to Michigan uh, to, to give you the next update on the project on, on, on more results on this. Other uh, project I wanted to bring up to your attention that we are working on uh, together with some other colleagues here at, uh, at Auburn University is the Down Timber Initiative that is started with some congressional funds that Senator Shelby from the state of Alabama gave us a couple of years ago to start looking into the utilization or the recovery of um, that uh, timber that is left behind after a catastrophic event. As you can, you know, here in the Southeast, we are very often hit by hurricanes and tornadoes that leave behind uh, multi-million dollars losses to our stakeholders and, and, and landowners. So what we've been uh, tasked to do is like to create these um, this, uh, ways of like, how can we recover this material quickly and how can we create products that will um, reduce the, the economic loss of this biomass. So one thing that we've, we've done, uh, this project started in 2020, right on uh, with the pandemic. So we, we started like, a, we, we mimic a tornado and we fell some trees in a control site in Andalusia, Alabama, which is about three hours south from, from Auburn. And we had a fell of, um, a number of trees of different ages. And what we are trying to do with this is to map what is the degradation of our biopolymers in the, in the fell trees. And if there is a way for us to assess on the field that we can relate to the biodegradation of these materials and see what, are, what is the, the time scale for recovery of these materials. So what uh, Muncaela, Javier and, and Casey have done um, over the a year and a half so far is that they have been going and collecting acoustic measurements in the, in the trees that, they, that we purposely felt. And then we have taken, um, taken uh, cookies of this material back to the lab, measure the NIR, uh, spectra and also the chemical composition of this and trying to like correlate all this data to see if there is a easy way for the landowners to, to assess the degradability, the degradation of this material on the site and see if how quickly can we recover these materials and how can we uh, make these materials into a use, usable uh, end product. 
so far our preliminary data indicates that uh, the at, at least the cellulose the the cellulose uh, component of these materials it takes about like 36 weeks to degrade, which is a wonderful news for applications like ours in terms of the utilization of cellulose for nanocellulose and added products. For the structural components, the, the equation became a bit slightly more complicated because of the, the torsion and the, and, the, and the stress that these trees are, are subjected to. And also if you think about a storm or a catastrophic event, you have like a, a good mixture of, of material that they will be very difficult to pinpoint what, what is the, the best material that you can take for, for structural component. But in terms of like isolating this biomass, there is a, a considerable window of time that will allow or would allow for, for us to utilize it. So one application that we are looking at this is like the isolation, uh, isolation of the lignin um, nanoparticles. And this is something that I, I've been talking to Dr. Meja for, for, for a while, and I'm very interested to, to expand our collaboration on this to create uh, lignin nanoparticles for uh, coatings that they will, prote they will protect uh, mass timber against UV uh, and uh, UV aging, and also uh, protect it against uh, humidity. Here you can see like a image or like a picture of the, this little like nano lignin nanoparticle. And what we've been doing so far is just playing with different um, solvent systems and, and how to like create the best uh, coating here, like a couple of coatings only of the lignin nanocell, the lignin nanoparticles. We haven't formulated them into coatings yet, but we have, uh, we believe that there is a lot of potential for, for this product to, to be developed as well. And here you can see like a um, video of the, hope you can see that, a video of the uncoated wood and coated with one of the, the lignin nanoparticles that we created where you can see that the contact angle against water improves um, significantly in the case of the lignin coated um, wood particles. So the second part of this talk, and I hope I'm doing well on time, um, I, will, I want to like quickly show you what other, um, other things we are intending to do in terms of uh, how can we impact the surface chemistry of nanoparticles of cellulose mainly and their performance in certain applications, namely absorption of contaminant in the water remediation uh, for, for, for uh, emerging contaminants, control release, and also diagnostics. So one um, project that I wanted to, to tell you about in terms of the water remediation is that something that um, Diego has been uh, doing, Diego has been working on the development of this uh, bio-based systems. So what we got inspired on the Great Lakes here there in Michigan with the, the, these like algae blooms and, and these toxins that they are generated by the, the algae, that they are very um, uh, toxic and, 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 and bad for human and wildlife uh, health. And we particularly focus in this micro system LR and try to like work on developing these uh, cellulose based um, materials. And also we play around with other type of uh, polysaccharides. And in, in this case, what we did with this, uh, we created these complexes using beta cyclodextrin and, and created se several different uh, assemblies of this material and tried to like move forward towards uh, creating this uh, capture um, capsule taking advantage of the of the hydrophobic hydrophobic cavity of the cyclodextrin and the and the great absorption capability of cellulose and, and chitosan try to create these uh, materials that they will capture the microcystin LR into the, the the systems. So we what we did was like um a several several assemblies in this case that like we started as everything starts in, in our lab in the in the two dimensional um, uh, state. So what we did was like created these like perf uh, model films of nanofibrillated cellulose, and we assembled the the cyclodexin in different ways. So we absorb it onto the nanocellulose, but also we graft it onto and uh, to the uh, to the um, the cellulose nanofibers. And what we did was like we monitor the absorption of this microcystin LR onto this uh, different system. And what we noticed was that the, the cyclodextrin 
um, graphic nanofibrillated cellular showed the most of the absorption onto the material. Now, this uh, absorption estimated, and I bolded and, and I italic estimated, was onto this two dimensional um, uh, nanofibrillated cellular cyclodextrin copolymer was much uh, higher than those reported in the literature, but this again needs to be taken uh, take it with a with a grain of salt because it's a model system. But however, we um, we identify this system as a very promising um, system to move forward. So what we, we did next was to assemble this two dimensional system into three three uh, D. And what we did in this case was to use uh, this same modification with the cyclodextrin, but instead of uh, directly to the cellulose we use chitosan as a subject and use the inherent absorption capability of the chitosan on to nanocell nanocellulose surfaces to create these systems. And we assemble this into bits and we assemble this into um, as a coding for, for nanogoods. In both cases, what we did was we coded this uh, cyclo uh, cyclodextrin um, grafted onto chitosan onto the lignin extracted, if you wish, uh, hydrogel or, or nanowood, and then also on these porous bits. And what we, uh, again, uh, we optimize the, the, the grafting of the cyclodextrin onto the chitosan, and then we prove that the coding material has a high, higher affinity towards the removal of microcystin. And this is a seminal work that I use uh, to move forward and, and, and continue investigating this and with the recently uh, funded um, Carrier NSF award that is on the assembly of polysaccharides towards uh, emerging contaminants removal. So on the same, uh, on the same topic, we would, uh, this is the work that UFA is doing also in the, in the area of water remediation and what uh, UFA is doing is just isolating nanofibrillated cellulose from soybean holes. Uh, using uh, temp oxidation on those and creating this hydrogel using PEI uh, by uh, cross-linking using uh, zinc um, ions. And she's using these hydrogels that they are like very steady and very uh, stable in, in water for, for a long period of time to, oops, sorry, um, to isolate, to um, use them to remove uh, water contaminants in this case. She, um, she's using like a methyl blue um, a dye to prove the, 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 the work. Unfortunately, the methyl blue um, behaves very differently with different pHs. So this develop a whole new area of work or like area of, of research where we are like trying to understand the fundamental of what is the, the behavior of these materials in, at different pHs. And it was a very interesting work to do, but what we um, developed was a material that will uh, eventually remove most of, the, most of the dye and it will induce the precipitation of some of, of it as well in a period of 48, um, 48 hours. And what we are doing with this material as well is like we add uh, graphene oxide to the, the tempo oxidized nanofibrillated cellulose PEI, um, PEI uh, hydrogels, and then we are also using this to remove metal, uh, not only dyes uh, from, from water, but also like um, uh, copper ions in this case. One uh, additional effort on towards water remediation was decorating uh, cellulose bits, these like uh, very highly porous nanocellulose bits in this case from uh, alternative sources to decorating with, uh, we have decorated them with uh, silver ions, and use them to remediate water against uh, bacterial contamination. So here in the Southeast, we also have a bad, um, a bad problem with uh, inv invasive species of feral hogs and that they leave a lot of uh, water uh, sources contaminated with E. coli. So we are trying, like we have partnered with the wildlife department into trying to use uh, cellulose-based materials to remediate this problem. And then uh, some other um, uh, example of these porous bits that I wanted to bring to your attention as well, also that ties along with the water remediation, is to use these uh, cellulose-based materials to 
decrease the amount of fertilizers that go into, into the soil at the time that we use uh, bio-based and renewable or like biodegradable uh, materials. So we use these uh, cellulose prills to load them with fertilizers in scale like NPK um, in different concentrations. And then we have uh, partnered with uh, some colleagues at the John, Cop John Hopkins University to create this cellulose uh, surface modification that will slow down the release of fertilizers, meaning that we are gonna, like it's a double fold. Um, objective on this is like to reduce the, the load of uh, NPK and also reduce the leaching of this material, but also to create an alternative that uh, material that will biodegrade compared to the acrylates that they are currently utilized. And also on the, on the same similar um, area on, on the control release materials. Uh, this is Sydney Break that she's about to de uh, re um, defend her master thesis on, on the development of these insecticidal fibers for um, load, them, load them with the pyrethroids. So the story behind this project is that the, the CDC was very invested into trying to find renewable sources for uh, insecticidal fiber nets for malaria control, for mosquito control, um, particularly in those countries with uh, low resource settings. So the United States spends millions of dollars sending um, uh, mosquito nets toward, towards Africa to decrease the, the, the death through malaria. And those become an environmental burden because they create a lot of waste. So one alternative is that we're looking at is to create this uh, same uh, mosquito nets using cellulose-based materials. And in this case, will be like regenerated cellulose that will be loaded with pyrethroids. So Sydney has studied, been spending the last couple of months studying the interactions between the pyrethroids and cellulose in different nanomorphs, and also what is the stability of these uh, insecticides into um, the, the ionic liquids that they are using, they, they are being used to create these uh, fibers. One last but not least project that I wanted to mention, I'm running a little late on time, is the towards the same um, same uh, issue on in this case on detection. Uh, we are trying to create this uh, bio base or renew renewable bio base the detection devices in this case. We've been looking at also malaria detection, trying to uh, create the, the more specific and, and, and selective binding of, um, of antibodies for detection of, of these diseases using nanocellulose. And we have partnered with chemical engineering, uh, the department where they, they will use this chemistry to create these MEMS that they will eventually replace the silica base uh, silicon-based MEMS that they are like currently utilized uh, for, for detection. And this is translatable not only for, for diseases, but also for cancer and other det detection, um, detection needs out, out there. So one very quickly, uh, we're very quickly like, like not only we focus on research, but we are very uh, invested in, in my group and, and at Auburn University into um, environmental awareness and also the, the inclusion or the increasing the literacy on STEM for those underrepresented, underrepresented minorities. And we partnered together with Dr. Mike Curry at Tuskegee University to create these uh, new modules that they can be implemented in the high school that they will be in a way um, uh, versatile enough to be implemented in, in, in a predominant predominantly white in, uh, community like is Auburn, but also translated to the, the Black Belt of Alabama where there is not enough uh, resources for them to, to create this type of uh, access to, to education. So what we are creating is a module on um, bio-based materials for water remediation that they can be uh, adopted by Alabama Science in Motion, which is a library that is accessible to all the teachers in the state of Alabama, that they can literally uh, pick up a tub full of the material that they need, borrow it for a week, take it to their classroom, and teach this, uh, uh, this uh, content, and hopefully that will increase the access and the interest of certain um, sectors of the, of the community of the state 
to increase their involvement in STEM. Then the last informer infomercial of the day, I wanted to bring your attention to a couple of uh, um, associations or like professional associations that I'm, I'm active on, that if you wanted to check out those websites and get involved and if you wanna reach out, uh, TAPI Nano is the, the Technical Association of Pulp and Paper Industries Nanotechnology Division that I am officiated as a research committee chair. Uh, the Cellulose and Renewable Materials Division of the American Chemical Society is always looking for, for new uh, engagement for different, uh, uh, different institutions, particularly students. If there are students interested, we are definitely looking to establish a student chapter on this, as well as the Forest Product Society, where I recently um, step up as a chair of the Southeast Division. And the reason I'm mentioning particularly the Forest Product Society is because they are looking into also increasing their uh, student chapter membership. They do have, unlike much of the other uh, societies or associations, they do provide monetary support to those student chapters. So it's an excellent opportunity to, to increase not only the involvement of students, but also the cross-pollination between institutions. So I will be very happy to, to discuss uh, something on, on those lines. And last but not least, I wanted to thank you for your attention and my wonderful group. This is a picture of my, my group of students that, that has been great, some of the funding opportunities. And, and here I, I leave you the, the link to our website if you wanna uh, take a look at it. And thank you for your kind attention and go in. Thank you so much, Soledad. That was a very, very uh, good presentation, excellent topic, and I'm really grateful for the time that you take to present. We actually have uh, less than a few minutes for uh, questions. If there is uh, one or two questions, maybe we can we can accommodate with that. And any I will questions be happy from to the answer audience? any questions. Okay, I'm, I'm just gonna ask a question. Um, so you mentioned briefly that uh, nanocrystalline cellulose is not biodegradable, but compostable. Uh, and what condition is not biodegradable? That is a, that's a really good question because like, well, that's exactly that we are trying to figure it out. Uh, we just studied a project on, on this, so I don't, have, I don't have an answer for you. I, do, I will say uh, that it will depend on, on the source and it will depend whether it, it has been modified or not. And that's something that I think that we as, as a scientist and like as a scientific community, we are like overlooking for sure because we insist on the biodegradability of these materials. And then we talk about all this chemistry that we do. And I think that we are not looking or paying too close attention to what that, what's the impact on, on, the, on the sustainability um, term for sure yes. thanks um i look forward to uh hearing you know, once your study is finished how what data you're getting on that because it's actually a hot topic for lignin products too whether right. they're degradable or not <laughs> other questions for uh solida i'm gonna ask another question since <laughs> the audience are quiet um, you mentioned that you use non, uh, lignin nanoparticles for coatings. Did you add it to any resin or how did you apply that coating? Not yet. So what I showed you was the pure, the pure lignin nanoparticles on the solvent so far. Mm -hmm. So we are, uh, we are actually like trying to like get, um, get moving with that project. We just submitted a proposal to USDA and, and see whether, whether we get funded or not, but we, we have not incorporated in any resin yet. But I'll be happy to discuss with you because I know that we have discussed this with you like in the past. So yeah. it, it's a really good time for us to like pick up that conversation. Yeah, I, yeah, I would love to. Hopefully, we can uh, discuss more details when we meet at WBC meeting. Sure. Again, um, if you all can please join me to thank uh, Soledad again. We really appreciate your time, and the recording is going to be available. And you are going to have access to Soledad email address if you have any further questions you can directly email her and ask your questions.